previously on Digest After Dark. Bro, that's all he cares about. I mean, his last HBCU interview was with who? With the Tyrone dude from Power. I mean, come on now. Let's be real. I, mean, I know we all got down to watch that. And also, he ain't even that professional. Like that. I ain't even that professional. He's sitting there but asking all these questions. He, 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 he's not even, he's not even a, to me, he's not even a good interview because he talks too much. He don't let anyone else talk. He's always, he's always sitting up there. Uh, uh, so I was thinking, I'm like, no, let's ask a question and shut up. 60, 60 minutes style. <laughs> HBCU Digest Radio, Digest After Dark. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Unfiltered and Uncensored Talk with young alumni from historically black colleges and universities. Also, thank you for checking out us on Sirius 142 HBC Radio on the Howard University Network of Broadcast Properties. Uh, very special episode today. We're going to be recapping and reviewing news about uh, Bennett College for women and it's uh, pending accreditation loss. Uh, it's it's not, just to be clear from the outset, it's not lost yet. They will be formally notified in January of the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges plans to drop them from their membership of accredited institutions, uh, which the university or the college has indicated it will appeal, uh, which will extend that, that process for several months, uh, at least uh, up through February where another review can be done. And then the school will go from there uh, regarding a, either reinstatement or if the commission upholds its decision uh, to potentially sue uh, the uh, the commission, which would also extend that until a legal proceeding can take place. So a long way to go, certainly before Bennett actually and physically loses accreditation. So that's that's the first thing that people listening need to know. Bennett is accredited. It's fully accredited and will be fully accredited for a minimum uh, a minimum likely of at least another year uh, the, uh pending all the outcomes that the school has available to them to to keep it so knowing that uh we begin our discussion today uh, captain crunch as usual the producer scholar jerisha by way of winston salem state and north carolina a t uh frat brother eric also by way of winston and udc and jabal moss by way of Payne and several hbcus where he has worked and then <laughs> consecutively left uh so <laughs> <laughs> um, this is, this is like <laughs> always shady and petty. <laughs> I've done the same thing, brother. So it's all good. But he yeah. has a problem with doing a crossover episode. You know, <laughs> he is. He's the ball. He's the ball of all HBCUs. Not <laughs> so I'm not going to deal with the shenanigans today. <laughs> so I mean, we we start here. So obviously, um, really really sad news because it's it's not like. Uh, Bennett is an institution where they've had uh, financial struggles or they've had leadership struggles and have not worked diligently to to resolve them or, or have ignored them. They've been very, very active in fundraising. They've been very active in trying to change the course of, you know, their their uh, their structure, their their operational structure to fix this. And unfortunately, it was it was unavoidable, at least in this round of accreditation review. So um I would ask start with Jerisha um, because you've actually worked there. Uh, mm -hmm. You're from North Carolina. What was your reaction to the accreditation announcement, and what do you see going forward for the school's efforts to try to have it reinstated by February? Um, my reaction was um, it was expected. I didn't know it would be this soon, though. Um, when I worked at Bennett, it was for a short stint. Um, from January 2016 to May 2016, and I had moved on to Alabama State or whatnot. But during that time, just from, you know, experiences like the processes and the systems at Bennett, I knew that it was coming, but I wouldn't, I didn't know it would be, you know, this soon, literally two years after I left, or well, two and a half years after I left the institution. Um, now, future-wise, I really think Bennett should pull back from appealing the SACS accreditation and go the Paul Quinn route and apply for tracks accreditation. Mm. Um, of course, you know, as Jabal has stated, you know, SACS is the most strictest um, accrediting body when it comes to their standards and expectations in regards to HBCUs. Um, and of course, Bennett being the first historically black college for females, um, 
I really think they need to, you know, go back to the drawing board and see where they need to possibly discontinue some programs or right size some departments um, as as well as um, adding um, to their curriculum in a sense because you know Bennett is a liberal arts based um, university. Um, they once had a two plus two program with North Carolina a and but I don't know if that is still viable. Um, but I do know when I was there, they signed a memorandum of understanding with Winston-Salem State University's nursing program mm -hmm. because it was females, students there who were interested in nursing, but they didn't have a quote unquote nursing program. Mm -hmm. um, the MOU was to understand the coursework at Bennett, literally prep them to um, get into their nursing program, uh, Winston's nursing program, or some 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 sort of agreement that how it was worked up, basically. Um, well, well, I I'm sorry, well, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I would love for Bennett to stay because not just they don't just have enriching history, but they um, they're technically the backbone of East Greensboro. Um, of course, you know you got. Literally, North Carolina A and T and Bennett are literally separated by a stoplight and train tracks. Right. If you've been to that area, but when you think about the strategic plan of North Carolina A and T, it doesn't incorporate the community like Bennett College does, um, because Bennett College, the development there at Bennett College is, is that they the students literally, the women there literally go out into the community and serve the community um, as opposed to A&T having, I'm sorry, that's my house phone, um, as opposed to A&T having this broader look of service as like a globalization um, aspect or piece to it. That's that's when, something we want to talk about a little bit later on, but I don't I didn't want to, to run before our first break, before we run out of time. I, I didn't mean to cut you off, sis, but um, I do want to get to Jabal because he trash talks sacks all the time. Um, specifically, my my dear my dear uh, higher ed mother, Dale Wheeler. Uh, <laughs> so I'm gonna give I'm gonna give I'm gonna let him flourish uh, for the next three minutes and, and do it again. <laughs> because that's obviously his reaction to this news is is what can we say about about sex and its engagement with not only Bennett but HBCUs at large. Um, as you have always pointed out. Bell Wheeling always says the standards are the same, but the resources are different. Mm -hmm. I have to disagree with her uh, when it comes to the standards for HBCU. I think when we think about sex in its entirety, I think there is a negative perception of what HBCU stand for. And when you have someone leading um, an organization that does not, in my opinion, see the values of historically black colleges and universities, despite um, what she says, um, I think they're targeted a little bit different. Um, and so as we think about Bennett, we think about December 2017 when the institution was given an additional year of probation and not being in compliance with core requirement 2.11.1, financial resources and stability, and comprehensive standard 3.10.1, financial stability of the principles of accreditation. Um, when we think about Bennett College, okay, we think about the operating budget. In 2010, they had a headcount of 780. Um, now they have an egg head count about 469, uh, which was up according to an article I read the other day of 15%. Mm -hmm. But in reality, that was really 2%. Um, if you really look at the numbers, because as I state all the time, colleges and universities get in trouble when they, when they give students scholarships and things of that nature. That's not real money, mm -hmm. but they count it as real money and not let, and they don't tell the true story that that is actually a discount where there's no money to really cover the scholarship. So I think Bennett has to do a better job at their, um, when they submit their report in February, their fifth monitoring report, they have to do a, a better job at showing the line items that are really discounted. Um, and also, um, come with a strategic enrollment management plan. Um, I think the issue with Bennett losing accreditation versus St. Aug is St. Aug had a money problem, not an enrollment problem, and right. the church bailed St. Aug out. But Bennett has a enrollment problem and not a money problem. Mm -hmm. So 
um, to piggyback on that, I think they have to show where they're going to increase enrollment and how they're going to bring students into the institution with some outdated programs. As I stated in uh, with my own institution, you can't operate like 1960 in 2018. So um, do I think Bennett College can win? Most definitely. But they most definitely have to have a team in place that can sell the institution, and they have to make sure that the committee that they have reviewing their report is non biased. Tiff, you um have a special love for 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 Bennett. Um, even though you wore a and T sweatshirt to our Christmas party over the weekend, um, no Bennett Bell T shirt, no Bennett Bell sweatshirt. Um, wow! You went to Howard. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, how do you weigh in on this? Um, first of all, don't do me. <laughs> Second of all, um, and you know we argued privately about how I don't want Bennett to close and XYZ. Um, I want to see Bennett better. And I kind of, or not kind of, I do disagree with um, Jerisha in a sense a a little bit because I don't want to see them I, I don't think their change comes from getting rid of programs or quote right sizing because when I think of right sizing at least at this point for Bennett now I think of downsizing mm-hmm. and they need to grow so I don't think it's a it's a thing of you know how you clip your ends so that your hair can grow longer mm-hmm. I don't I don't think that's necessarily going to work for Bennett in enough time for them not to lose their accreditation and that's what I worry about. And I don't know how we can bolster enrollment in what seems like zero time for them to have a bigger operating budget. I just I don't see. I don't I don't want to not see it, but I don't see it. That's a, that's actually an excellent point, because most colleges think that existence means to grow. And I've always mm-hmm. been of the opinion that sometimes you you can grow, but it has to be relative. You may not grow from. 1,000 to 5,000 students, but you make them grow to 1,500 students and have some of the best programming in some key areas uh-huh. that make sense for your region or your city. So growth means different things to different campuses, but it is that is a great analogy to think about for Bennett, But and I also agree with you that, yeah, the timing is is gonna be a real obstacle, and, and, and Frat, you, you can weigh in on this too. That's gonna be a real obstacle when you say, do something in three months that you haven't been able to do in three years. I think it's interesting because, I mean, we, we've had a couple of themes over the past couple of, uh, between online and on the podcast, uh, of of support of our schools, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and there was a brief moment where we kept seeing a lot of celebrities that were wearing um, uh, paraphernalia from certain HBCUs and all that sounds really great and it looks good and it's a good a pu- pu- um, publicity situation for some of our schools, and um, while while I'm here, I just want to give a shout out to um, Dr. Artis and um, everybody down there at Benedict that actually took out money in their own pockets and put some bread towards uh, Bennett. Um, but it's interesting right now because, like you said, this is an issue of enrollment um, because that that's where the accreditation uh, is kind of hinged upon like not having enough students to a degree and i'm wondering outside of you know the the powers that be that are within this podcast and those who we actually know and advocate for these schools who's going to be the ones to step out and kind of push people to applying to go to school at bennett um there are some people who want who believe that they are um the the ones that speak to to hbcu issues on a, on a public sphere, but they've been relatively silent on this on this topic. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and I'm the Roland Martin. <laughs> oh, they call the oh. names today. Okay, Whoa. semester almost over. <laughs> right, right. Um, and, and it's not just it's not just him, right? So it's, it's like it's many of us. Um, we had a brief discussion on the timeline where things have been relatively silent from Bennett's brother school. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I feel as though. Well, so well you great. can't sweep at nobody else, though, when your door ain't swept. <laughs> All right. Ooh. 
and we might we might need to take a break because <laughs> yeah. that's two spicy things Jabal that dropped in, in less than thirty seconds. So let me take a break. We go off of this brother some water, and, and, we'll, and, and when we come back, <laughs> when we come back, we're actually going to talk uh, to a sister from Bennett to talk about the view on the campus and and what's being done uh, to accompany all of the outside efforts to support uh, Bennett in the weeks and months to come. This is that just after dark. We'll be right back. That just after dark, and we're back. Uh, privileged to be joined right now by Ms. Sean Hall. She's a 1993 graduate of Bennett College for Women, uh, talking with us about the view and the perspective on the campus and what things people on the outside, meaning non bells, and we mean that in a positive way, could do to support the sisters as they work uh, to boost financial stability uh, at the college and in a, in a lot of ways prepare um, because I think what's going on with Bennett is going to be happening to a lot of campuses going forward in the next few years so the way that Bennett will fare um, is going to be a blueprint for uh, uh, how a great deal of our campuses will have to prepare and react um, when stuff like this happens so Miss Hall thank you so much sis, for joining us this morning first of all can you tell us about the, the, the perspective or the energy on campus right now having talked to several Sisters who also graduated from Bennett, students who've graduated. What's the attitude in Greensboro right now? The attitude is that people are prepared to fight. We want to organize. Of course, the big question is always, what can we do? When can we do it? And so ours is making sure that our message is succinct and that it is unified. You've read several articles in Inside Higher Ed in Blavity where we're talking about Bennett raising $5 million or our doors will close. And so what I want to submit to your listeners is that we have actually two numbers. The survive number is $5 million. The thrive number is $50 million. And why do I say that? Because if you only look to bring in the $5 million in two years, you'll be back back at the same place. And so what we can't afford to do is miss this crisis, which is our capital campaign. Mm. We have to ask for what we need now. And let this be a cautionary tale for other HBCUs to make sure that alums are getting the actual number, what's really needed at the college, not just for this particular year, not just for this budget, but where are we financially? And so I'll say uh, pretty confidently that perhaps we've been asleep at the wheel as alums, not being as involved as we should be. I will admit that firsthand, but I am fully woke, as they would say, and we are prepared. We have organized ourselves. Uh, We have an additional committee. It is the, uh, it is called the Committee for Change and Progress for Bennett College. And we are dedicated solely towards the fiscal stability of the institution. And what we hope to do there and what we are doing is we are asking for commitments, not just from celebrities. I love Beyonce. I love Jay-Z. But I also love people like Superset. That sister went out there and pulled down $1 million in 90 minutes. Those are the kinds of people that we're looking for. Why? Because they reflect our population. They're black women who have black owned businesses and we are supporting them and we're asking them to support us. I'm going to let it ride that y'all didn't send me an article to post in the digest. You got Blavity. Shout out to them. Shout out to Inside High Red. Nothing for the HBCU digest. That's cool. Um, uh, please, no shade involved. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. That's okay. Please forgive me. Um, so, Here's, so here's the question. So did you did you feel or do you feel at any point? Because I would tend to disagree that you guys were sleep at the wheel because Bennett raises money to raise like two, three or four million dollars is isn't a small thing. So I, I wouldn't c- categorize it as a sleep at the wheel. But did you feel that the school was in communication with you along the way, particularly from 2015 until now, about the challenges that were that the, that the campus was facing financially? I am going to have to say no. We have not, they have not been as as transparent as we would like to be, and that's been a fatal flaw. However, I will say this, that perhaps there are those who thought uh, they were taking a page from the movie A Few Good Men, where Jack Nicholson said, you want the truth, you can't handle the truth. And that may have been the truth for some people, that they would not have been able to handle the dirty truth. But there are those of us who I believe if you tell us the truth, you tell us the true me, as you've seen historically and as you've noted, we will rise to the occasion. But what you can't get 
get involved in is what we call in education the tyranny of low expectations. If you don't expect a lot from your student, you won't get a lot. And so while $4 million is a lot, the thing is, it wasn't enough. And so now we've got to get to our thrive number and say, where do we need to be in order for Bennett to survive, revive, and thrive? That's got to be our battle call. Well, let's, th- let's talk about that next part. So how does, how does Bennett thrive? Because I think that there are some issues that I, I think a lot of us on the, on the call have had divergent views, um, but all aiming towards the same thing. What, how do we make Bennett better and an emerging or, or premier factor in HBCU education? Because right now, some of the challenges are, do you have programs that make sisters want to come and choose Bennett as a number one college? And, and, and is enrollment more of an issue than the finances because you guys can go out and raise 10 million dollars a year but that's tough for any school period whereas you can't out raise you can't out fundraise tuition dollars and so where does the conversation come from the sisters about what do we do about this enrollment issue that's a great question and i think there's a three-pronged approach that how i would phrase this initially i'm a woman of faith And so I go back and I look at a story in Nehemiah where they were rebuilding the wall. And in one hand, they had their materials. (laughs) In one hand, they had their materials and they were building. And in the other hand, they had their weapons and they were fighting. And that's what we have to do. We're building and fighting simultaneously. So it's not finances first or enrollment. It's both of those things at the same time. In order to even look at enrollment, your doors have to stay open. Mm-hmm. But while we're focusing on that, we also have to look at what do we do well. We educate. We put out more teachers than anyone else. And so when we look at that, we have to say, how do we continue to develop this pipeline? And not just look at African Americans, but look across this world as we look at educating women, period. How do we bring those people into our institution? Bennett has sent women to China, to Turkey, to Russia, to South Africa. We are global players, and we're on that stage. But what it is is getting people to recognize and remember their greatness and go back and say, let me introduce myself. I'm Bennett College, and I'm here to stay, and we want your students. Here's what we can offer. And while you're doing that, you're going to have to entreat different corporations corporations we had the Wajin corporation back in 2016 pay for 20 of our students to come over to china for two Mm -hmm. weeks to study clean energy we need to go back to them and ask them will they partner with us yet again and allow some of their students to come here now i'm about to go deep and if you allow some of those students to come here there's a little thing called an eb5 visa and when you get into that You're starting to tap different monies at a different level, which will allow your college to be sustainable. Those are the kind of innovative things that alums are in the process of thinking of and bringing to the table to say, here's how Bennett becomes entrepreneurial and enterprising, because that's the only way we're going to survive. It can't be an enrollment based model anymore. You guys Mm -hmm. have been working with the school again for three years in the most recent, because this isn't the first time that Bennett has had accreditation issue. Um, That's correct. The, and you guys have gotten out of it before and we expect that you'll get out of it again. But do you believe that this administration, as is constructed, will take the feedback from the from the alumni and say, OK, we're going to do it your way? Because apparently and I don't mean this in a shady way, apparently they've not done it in the past. I will acknowledge that in the past, the administration has not acknowledged the alumni association and perhaps even the alums who are not affiliated with the association i think what's different this time is that we're not asking i'm not asking for a seat at the table i'm telling you that i'm here and so being here my presence and stepping up (laughs) demands acknowledgement in and of itself because not only am i coming as one person i've got ten thousand sisters standing beside me and behind me saying we want to see you succeed and so now the question becomes is this about any one set administration? And I know that it's not. This is about Bennett College. This is about 145 years of legacy. This is about 50 former slaves who scrimped together their money to buy the land that we sit on, and we refuse to disappoint them. We refuse to say that what you dreamed of has now become a nightmare. I won't let that happen on my watch. 
And then the final. Somebody put her in advance man office right now. <laughs> <laughs> and then the and then the final thing I would ask you is so again with all of these things in consideration and all, all of the passion and all of the intellect and the planning behind this is is very well taken. Can you do it with Christmas, Martin Luther King Day, before school opens back up? Can we pull this off in three months? Even before February. Now, I say that with the caveat that is, you obviously have more time. There's a lot of there's an appeal process. There's a lot of things that can happen. So let's take it from the the most generous perspective and say, can you do this in a year? Because it's been some years, and we've not seen that kind of progress. Can you take it by force and then say, in a year, this is where we'll be? I believe so. I'm going to go back to the book of Nehemiah just because that's where I've been. Nehemiah rebuilt that wall in 52 days. <laughs> She's going back to the word. We can do it. Building after the rubble. Got, because it all starts Standing to stop the, the word. Listen, because the truth of it is, we were founded by the United Methodist Church, Church. if you will. You know? mm-hmm. so, so when we look at that, that's our root. I'm not going to go away from the word. And I know that people said pray, but faith without works is dead. We're out here working it. I'm here talking with you every single day. I've been on the phone. Our committee members have been on the phone making the appeal to people who have been despondent, who have been disgruntled and saying, give us another chance. Give us another chance. Give yourselves another chance. We are necessary in this community. We are not irrelevant. We're still players, and we still have very much to offer. So if Nehemiah can do it in 52 days, I have full confidence that Bennett College can. Where's the church organ? <laughs> Where's the collection <laughs> plate? That was powerful stuff. Sean Hall. And let, and let me say that. When you're passing that collection plate, we're asking people to give any combination of 1873 to Bennett. That was the year we were founded. So if it's $1.8 million, if it's $187,300, if it's $187 if it's $18.73 make your not a donation because a donation you don't care about you give it away but investments when you're a steward when you're a steward over your funds you come back and check on your investment so I'm going to tell people Google us come back check us out hold us accountable but invest and don't give a dollar eighty seven cents. That ain't gonna work. That we're not. We're no, not dollar. That. You can't cash up a dollar eighty seven. It won't work. Sean <laughs> <laughs> so, Hall, we appreciate you so much, sis. Thank you for your time. Anybody from the anybody from the congregation that wants to weigh in on what the sister just had to say? Nah, she said it all. She said it all. She said everything that needed to be said and gave us the benediction in one. We <laughs> Hallelujah. Coming from our hood, bougie. Uh, <laughs> evangelist <laughs> this is this outstanding i mean and i hope and I, and i think that the biggest takeaway from this is this is a this is an exercise in if there has been no other and will be no other this is an exercise in alumni and administration working together because at a certain point if your activists and advocates aren't bought in or you're not listening to them this is the this is the byproduct now you're in yeah. now you're in crisis response mm-hmm. mode. So we're going to see if we can see for the first time a true bridging of stakeholder organizational partnership in the way of not just fundraising, not just crisis fundraising, but academic development, enrollment management, Jabal, like you always talk about strategy building, community outreach, all these things. So definitely definitely an honor to have you on uh sis and um we, we look forward to not only this not be the first and last time but continual updates about what the alumni association is doing uh to raise money and to to build awareness and to support the institution in growing its profile thank you again thank you again for having me i'm grateful for the honor and we're going to take our, our second break when we come back we're going to try to digest what the pastors just said uh, and then we're going to move on to uh, uh, aspects of the of the challenges and how they're going to have to be overcome in the next uh, months and years to come. Dodgers at the Dark. We'll be right back. Dodgers at the Dark. Uh, we're talking Bennett College and this road to uh, uh, reaffirmation and growth uh, in the months and years to come. Again, if, you, if you're just joining us or just tuning in. Uh, the conversation was about uh, the announcement from the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges that Bennett uh, will um, soon lose its membership in its accredited uh, body of schools, uh, but has opportunities up into February and possibly beyond to appeal or sue for it. So we just finished a conversation with uh, a, a Bennett, a, a sister of Bennett, Sean Hall, who, who remains with us. Who talked about the fundraising and the and the realignment and reengagement efforts uh, that several sisters from the college are, are taking 
uh, in Greensboro and beyond. But I do think that this invites an important conversation with guys about how do you get alumni? We know that there are challenges for alumni to work with or with with administration and vice versa. Administration to work with graduates on getting a school right. But what do we have to say or what do we think about the idea of crisis situations splitting alumni into different factions? For example, it's not just Bennett. We've seen the same thing happen with Bethune-Cookman. Some graduates are over here saying, we want to do this. The Alumni Association is saying, here's our position. We've seen the same thing at, at Southern, at FAMU. Some alumni are over here doing one thing. The association as the, as the official body is doing another do you think that that is part of the obstacle of all sides getting together and saying, let's accomplish this goal? Tiffany, let's start with you, because yes. Howard, I don't think that you see a lot of those public splits, but you do see that a uh, lot of people have different really voices, at least behind the scenes. We had a really good split in, in March. Whenever uh, this whole financial aid thing happened, there was a pretty good split. And I've been trying not to think about it <laughs> since you brought it up. But we just gonna have to go there. Um, but continue on with your question. Well, the question <laughs> is, what do you think? What? Do you, how do you think you get people together? And the, and let's just be honest about it. The split occurs because some people in alumni associations they have relationships with people in administration. They have relationships with people on the board of trustees. So they don't necessarily want to run countercultural. To the, the friendships and the relationships they have of the people who are running the campus. But okay, sometimes the right. people who are running the campus don't have the global right. view of how serious this is or what it's going to take to get out of this. Right. Look, relationships do not supersede the good of the condition of the university. You would think so. Amen. No, no, no. In order for that to that statement to be true there is no relationship that can supersede the good of the condition of the university and when you have that attitude you have to make that clear to people and so specifically personally as somebody that has a different level of engagement and relationships with my university leadership and other HBCU leadership that's something that I keep in my mind because I don't ever mm -hmm. want for there to be some misunderstanding because there are, there are alum who do good things in their in their alumni associations and their local clubs and everything but like if you're trying to make a, a systematic push that requires equal parts between the local alumni association the Nas national association and the actual campus, like mm -hmm. you, there has to be that understanding. But see, everybody so thinks that they're doing. Not. Everybody thinks that they're doing good. Not to cut you off. Nobody thinks that. Yes, let's go out and destroy the school. But right. I think that the difference is, and Jabal, let me bring you in on this because you've worked in this with pain. You've 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 co you've interfaced with board. You've interfaced with boards, alumni, school, wow. otherwise. What, how do you how do you navigate the differences of opinion on how do you approach something serious like an accreditation review or accreditation loss? I think the both the biggest thing that you have to do is stand firm on your beliefs. Um, and when you don't have a firm belief system, you don't um, you kind of get suckered into everybody else's opinion. Um, and right. so, I think. You know, for me, I was on the board of trustees as a as a student, as a SGA, as SGA president. Then I was the youngest elected alum to the board of trustees for the National Alumni Association. And then navigating that with those relationships I formed on the board of trustees and being outspoken about leadership and then being outspoken about not putting a plan together to address accreditation. Um, and, you know, I was that alum, and I said it uh, before, that people hate it. Um, but when you value your institution and you know what your institution has um, to offer the world, you stand firm on your belief system about making it better. And I think that that navigation comes from those relationships. 
from being honest with those people that you're friends with on the board, being honest with those alums who hate you, being honest with those alums who like you, um, and letting them see the bigger picture. The bigger picture is not about one person. The bigger picture right. is about the college. And I've said this over and over again. Schools are supposed to outlive this alums. Mm -hmm. The alums are not supposed mm -hmm. to outlive the institution. Mm -hmm. And so Come when on. you get the mindset that you are saving your school for generations to come, it takes you out of the equation. And exactly. because when, when it's just focused on you and what you think is, is, is the main reason the school should survive, you fail every time. So the, right. the most prominent point to make is always your school should live longer than you. I totally agree with you, but Jerisha, that doesn't happen. And there are too many campuses where we see how the divide plays out and no one, no one fixes it. No one says, okay, well, let's talk about how we, we come to a middle ground. We have one group doing one thing, another the group doing another thing, and no one takes a position. And I'm going to tell you how logistically this, this is damaging. Sean talked about the lack of communication they may have received from the administration about exactly what the financial picture was. What was the enrollment picture? How many people are we going to need to get to pull this off? How much money are we really going to need to pull this off? There's a reason that not only did that not come from the school, but it didn't come from the alumni either. And by the way, both of them have separate mechanisms oftentimes of how they alert other stakeholders about what's going on. Whether that happens, right. whether that happens through a website, whether that happens through an email, whether that happens through distributions that go to alumni chapters all over the country, and whether they tell their membership, so you're not only talking about this is a this is a this is something we have to confront, but now you're talking about avenues by which people even know that there is something to be confronted. This isn't right. changing. It's happening at several institutions all over the country the same way. What? Literally, what are we supposed to do? Because there are people living this that are going to listen to this and say, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. It can't be about one person. How do you change it? Mindset. Let me offer something. Oh. If I can. Um, yeah. I think I would say stay in the book, right? And I'm not talking about the word, but I'm talking about for Bennett College, we are in the same book. The National Alumni Association is in the book. And the Committee for Change and Progress for Bennett College, we're in the book. We're not on the same page. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. We're in the book. And I think if you will do that, that's, that's where the fighting really starts. You're trying to get me to dissolve my organization or see it the way you see it, to value the relationships that you value, to put your relationships over the good of the college when I don't think that that's best, when I know it's not best, uh, to not be, you want me to not be as vocal. You want me to not share as much. But again, my goal is not to get on the same page. My goal is to stay in the book, which is Bennett College, and move her forward keep her first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And I think if we do that, we'll be at a good place because I may never win you over as the NAA. My goal is not to be NAA president. My goal is not even to be chapter president. My goal solely is to make sure that we survive, that we revive, and that we thrive. That's it. Dries, you were going to say? Um, I cannot personally speak on this because uh, my two alma maters are very transparent in my opinion, when it comes to what is going on. Um, and I can't, and I'm not going to sit here and compare because that would be just outright wrong. But I do agree with Sean and her views on how to operate um, as, or as organizations, as alumni organizations or a, um, you know, a outside committee, because at the end of the day, like, like Jabal said, it's about the school. You want the school to be here another 145 years um, to not just, you know, um, serve the community, but educate the community as well because they have a purpose and also that um, there, there is a place for being at college for women. Um, and I just hope that they find that niche in their place so that they can capitalize off of it and keep creating more women like Miss Sean um, that we need out here in this world. Eric, Aww, thank you. Eric, let me let me throw it to you real quick, Brad, because you actually okay. work with an organization that 
uh, specializes in in focused advocacy, legislative advocacy for HBCUs, the HBCU Collective. This is outside of the universe of a NAFIO, a TMCF, a UMCF that all do the same thing. This is a group of young alumni who said, we want to do it this way, and you went out and did it. Um, two or three years, I think, of advocacy, or legislative advocacy day on the Hill. When does it get to the point where you say, these bigger, older groups aren't doing it the right way, we need to do it this way, and then you get some people together and y'all do it, but then you start to get pushback from the older groups. <laughs> how, do you, how do you get, as Sean said, in the same book with those bigger groups? This is going to come across real wrong, and I got to preface it just like that. Um, <laughs> oh, Lord. Older generations have a responsibility to teach what they know, give space to the younger ones to come up with better plans, and to then eventually move out the way. And I'm not saying that this to silence older generations, but the, the, the focus of it's like with any organization, right? Things are done a certain type of way, and you want things to always be done the same type of way. But meanwhile, the world's moving forward. Things change. Things become better. Things become automated. Things become streamlined. And you want to keep doing things the same way. And things don't... like it, 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 If it ain't broken, then don't try to fix it doesn't work when you're not being honest about the fact that it needs to be fixed and when you yeah. have you have alumni groups that are some of the younger alumni that are coming up and they're doing good work and they're trying to address an issue that they see fully because they're right in the middle of it and they get pushed back from those who have a lot a little bit more power a little bit more mm -hmm. influence and mm -hmm. just general for the simple, for the simple fact of the matter, they have a little bit more money because they've been making money, make, making money longer. a lot longer, <laughs> yeah. right? Right. At some point, it was like we we don't us who are young, who, us who are younger, us sub forty folks, we don't have all the answers. And I'm not gonna sit here and say that we have all the answers, but we all like it's like she said, we we all trying to say in the same book. The ultimate goal for us is the same goal. We want our schools to survive and to do well. But when you have so much infighting because people have ego problems, when you have people who just think that things should just go the way that they've always been because it's comfortable for them, right? It, it's bigger than just you by yourself. And, and I, I see that a lot from the legislative end um, of, of working with. I see that working in higher education. You have a lot of people who just think things are, well, the process of these have always worked. But I'll tell you why that's a challenge. I'll tell you why I think it's part of the challenge, and that's going to be our last section, like some of the challenges that are in the way. But to your point about specific, specifically about if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Bennett and so many other HBCUs have fixed it over the years without the, the outward push from alumni and students. Let, like we let, said, this let wasn't. Let me interrupt and say something, though. Let me interrupt and say something. There in is the fatal flaw yep. it was never fixed it was never Look fixed like that was going to be my point they never right? fixed it it was the you never fixed it it was it was a stopgap measure you 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 did the tourniquet right you did the tourniquet but when you opened them up i, I want to go to glinda hatchett's daughter-in-law very vibrant she was pregnant she gave birth her husband said that she wasn't doing well they alerted the the nurses that were going to do a cat scan and some other tests and every hour he kept asking, and they kept putting it off. And they kept putting it off, and they kept putting it off. Finally, they said, you know, she's not at the top of the list. She's just not a priority. By the time they opened her up, nine hours later, she had three liters of blood in her abdomen, and she had hemorrhage. She was dead. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening to our colleges. By the time you open this situation up, it's too far gone to be remedied. But that is that is the, the challenge that because in previous years they didn't know what too far gone meant. They and thought I wanna, and I want to add to that. Go ahead, Bob. I want to add to what she said. I think the problem is too many times the board leadership because it's primarily happening at our private HBCUs. We're just going to talk about it. Our private HBCUs have too many people on board of trustees that don't have financial rhetoric. Mm -hmm. um, and when we talk about Board of Trustees, and I've said this over, I'm spicy today, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I am tired of going into boardrooms that have 20 people on the board and 17 of them are pastors. Ooh. 
come on. And come on. Now, one of them has raised any money for their church building fund. Oh, but you're going to no. sit on the board and tell me how to <laughs> direct funds for the institution to continue to operate. Oh, my. That's right. It's not going to happen without dated practices. Mm-mm. So, look. No. And then you, but that's and the then you get people on. The, uh, and in my, it, the demographics might have changed, but the average age of the board member uh, board is, is about 55 and up. Hold up. Let me bring a gallon. Yeah. Of, yeah. I need to bring y'all a gallon of water in here. Let me take another break. <laughs> Cause y'all getting into ages, y'all talk about people, y'all talk about the preachers. So let me stop <laughs> and save this for the last juiciest and spiciest section, which is the actual problem. Cause we do want to get into that. But let's take one last break. Dodgers after dark. We'll be right back. Dodgers after dark, and we're uh, continuing our conversation about Bennett College and its road back to recovery and reaffirmation and thriving. Uh, Captain Crunch, Teresa Scholar, Fred Brother Eric, uh, Jay Moss, and Sean Hall from Bennett College, a uh, uh, graduate of Bennett College. So let's get into the real conversation about the actual challenges. So here's I'm going to outline some of them as I see them. Number one, it's a, it's a private school. Um, and I say that as a challenge because, as Jabal said, you you have a, a certain set of, of challenges that, that are very difficult to overcome. First, no one's going to check the board. The board is is self-surviving and self-appointing. There is no oversight body that tells the board what to do, who to appoint, who to let go, X, Y, and Z. Number two, even with the the, the private designation, there is no oversight body that says you have to report some of your financial standing. Other than an annual report, there's nothing that forces them, and, and tax returns, there's nothing to say, here's what you made, here's what you spent, here where some of your problems lie. And there's no other mechanism to force their strategic plan to be revealed to anyone short of who they want to show it to. Um, number two, from a, from a big perspective, and I don't mean this is in a shady way, and we've been debating this for a couple of days. It is a real problem that the explosion of North Carolina A&T parallels the danger facing Bennett College. Um, it is not to say that Bennett is not an attractive college is not a productive college in what it does for its its students and its graduates. It is to say, from a global perspective, and that's all I do, I just sit and look at all these schools from a, a, a bird's eye view. There are, there, are, there are few colleges, if any, growing as fast or as comprehensively as North Carolina A&T. Uh, uh, nationwide. They're at 12,000 students. Nobody's even close. They're probably gonna be the first HBCU period to get to 20,000 students. Nobody's even close. So, I mean, it, it, barring anything happen like a leadership change or some kind of some kind of you know legislative push that does something otherwise, if they're on the trajectory now, they're they're likely to get to twenty thousand students in a certain amount of time. Um, that that can't that can't be underscored because that is going to shape the way that you recruit. That is going to shape your value proposition when you talk to students who have choices, and that's going to talk about some of the things that you have to do academically. As if to say, what are we doing and at what price point that makes us more unique or more profitable or more be- or a better option than, than the school right across the train tracks? Number three, it has to be something where, and, and Jerisha talked to this earlier about the, 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 the amount of outreach that the, that the college does. There clearly is a, is a reason and there is a justification for a women's college in 2018 if you didn't believe it before all you got to do is say me too all you got to do is look at how many black women are in entrepreneurship all you got to do is look at how many black women are being elected to government there is a place for education that is that is gender exclusive there's no question about it does the general population know that so much in the same way that there is a there's a place for hbcus do most african americans know that or are they sold by other things like who went to the sugar bowl? Are they sold by other things like who has the best the best buildings? Are they sold by other things like who's in the in the fastest growing city? It's not a question of what value the institution has, it's a question of do are people willing and open to understand what that value is. So now we can go free for all spice now. Can I? Absolutely. So from working in higher ed and students choosing colleges, students usually choose 
fed college based off their parents' reaction. And the number one thing that gets a parent's reaction is well, number well, two things is safety and price. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. From working at Bennett, being how small it is, um, and what it offers as an institution, like I'm looking at the prices now for 2018, 2019, and just to live on campus is 29,659. When you live off campus, it's two hundred dollars cheaper. There's no differentiation yeah. with with tuition price, basically. And also, when you look at the other colleges in the surrounding area, including the community college, GTCC, which is made up of six campuses, Bennett is the most expensive institution, higher four year institution, to attend in the city of Greensboro. So that I believe is a problem because price and also um, safety because their public safety is probably no more than three people, four people at the most. Being that the being that it's four hundred and sixty girls there, the ratio to public safety officers to female students on campus needs to be a little bit higher in my opinion just from you know doing studies on what you know draws what draws parents and students towards your institution and it's not, and again it's not the shade bennett it is to say right. here are a real set of factors these are real factors that influence and can make the difference between 469 students and 714 students so which makes the difference just, just real quick which makes the difference between do alumni got to raise 10 million dollars or are they okay raising four or five a year? Right. Go ahead, Tim. And that's the well, that's the thing. If if we have to keep now, and I'm speaking as if I'm I'm a, I'm a bell, but I'm not. But if as an alumni, we're, we're, we're all bells, <laughs> even the brothers. <laughs> Come on, brother Bell. <laughs> if you have to keep raising five million dollars every year, then it's somebody in your institutional effectiveness or advancement office that doesn't need to be there no more. Mm-mm. Well, well, <laughs> oh, Tiffany, you go say. Well, <laughs> yeah. So I I agree with that first part, uh, Drisha, about how children or students, I should say, tend to temper their college choices around what their parents say. And though I really uh, don't like to talk about my mother's podcast episode, <laughs> <laughs> at the same time. Don't sit here, man. <laughs> You want to sit here and lie? <laughs> she told y'all what she and my father, what, what they do. Like, it, it is it is a, a thing, or should be the case for everybody, where it's like, yo, this is what my child says they want to do. I'm going to make sure mm-hmm. that my child can get as close to that point or that goal as they possibly can. And all, all we are really talking about is support. When a child feels like he or she can do whatever, they will attempt whatever. All we need is support. And so to that, I think about that in terms of, well, in my daily life, helping children figure out or students figure out what their best fit HBCU is. They literally are blank slates. Some of them come with support. Some of them come without support. Some of them don't believe in themselves. So we have to build them up and be supportive so that they can go on to choose a better, in my opinion, HBCU at, at that better school than they would if they hadn't met me and my, and my team. But that's an, that's an excellent point because I, Bennett, Bennett recruits heavily. It's again, this is not a, a question of the, is the school lacking in, in some minimal operational areas. They recruit, the alumni recruit, they fundraise. So everything that you would hope that the stakeholders would do, they are doing. The question is, do you do you have enough sisters doing it and can they move fast enough that they can get up out this hole? Now, the other thing is, this is from an institutional perspective, Sean. Has been it done academically? Has it done culturally the things that it should do so that when you go to a sister who is choosing between a Bennett or a Spelman or North Carolina A&T or even UNCG, that it is clear and it is no question 
based on their personality, of course, that that Bennett is the right choice. I probably have to say no. And again, I think it doesn't behoove me to lie. It doesn't behoove the institution for me to sugarcoat it. We've, we've not done everything that we could do, uh, and, and that's being every person, every bell sitting on the wall. Now, again, some of this gets back to personality clashes. Some of this gets back to power tips and struggles, all of the things that we've talked about before, and it mires down to recruitment. It mires down to enrollment because there are people who would get out there and go and recruit. But I want to be honest just for two seconds because I think it'll bless somebody's life. I hope some of my Bennett sisters are listening. Hello. When you have people in areas like Alabama, or you have people in areas uh, of, of Georgia, different pockets of Georgia, and the only recruit boots that you have on the ground are alum, mm-hmm. it behooves you to get the most recent information to them yep. and in an expedient fashion. When that doesn't happen... You don't hurt me personally. You hurt the university. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You, you hurt my you you hurt my opportunity to get the word out about Bennett because people know Miss Sean and how great she is and how how many things that she's done. But you don't see anything in writing because that's what I tell all of my daughters. I've got four girls, and I tell them always get it in writing. Let's read something. Don't tell me how great Bennett is. Show me. Okay, I'm gonna even go you one better. We are now in the 21st century. Give me some visuals. Let me see a little clip that somebody's put together for two minutes and 30 seconds that shows the college where you've been and where you're going. You've got to do that. We're not in the dark ages anymore. But that, We're and, not. And this actually, and I'm going to go to Jabal at this point because this speaks to his point about is there a different set of rules accrediting wise? Because part of the way that you salvage your accreditation is by saying, okay, if we're not making enough money, we've reduced our costs. And sometimes mm-hmm. in reducing the cost, Guess what department gets hit first? Institutional yeah. advancement, marketing and public relations, fundraising. Look, would you look at that? PR and, coming and up and all over again. Student campus life on that list too. That what, see what I mean? So the things that that would br- would bring you students and the people who would design those materials and shoot those videos and all that kind of stuff, typically those are the ones well, that get hit hit first. Not the well, vice president that makes double the salary of two or three people on campus, not the, not the director but this of something. Is true. This is true, but this is where our strategic thinking comes in. We have a sister, I'm going to put her right out there. Her name is Michelle Huff, Huff Entertainment. Her client, Tamia. Her client, Grant Hill. Mm-hmm. This is what she does. She does PR for a living. So when your people get cut, what you have to do is engage your alum. First, you got to know who we are. You got to know your boots on the ground. You got to know our proficiencies and our skills. And you reach out to them and say, hey, can I get, we've got about, and I'm making this up off the top. We've got about 15 sisters that I know in PR. You can hit each of them and ask for pro bono services for a month. And that takes you through 15 months yep. where we have utilized their resources and not ours. That's how you get this done so that it, the work still continues, even if you had to cut a little bit. But when you don't know who the alum, who the alums are, then you can't really tap into our skill set. Then the university as a whole suffers. Eric, you going to say? Mm-hmm. I just, it's too many things going on right now. And I'm down here. <laughs> <laughs> I have y'all to agree. Gonna, y'all gonna have to forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, let's we'll come back to you, Fred. No, no, Boy, no, you were no, gonna. No, 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 because I was gonna, I was gonna say, I, I, I didn't want to rehash the story, but like, you know, we we don't we talk about and Darisha and I, we we go through this all the time. We talk and we talk about how a lot of issues that higher education has gets lauded as issues that black schools have. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jesus. <laughs> and, and and you know, and the biggest difference is is how much money in the coffers you have to st- to, uh, to to prevent things from getting out there to the masses as perception damaging events. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. damage control basically. Right. So you know, you just brought up the whole thing about where does the money come from? Where 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 the budget get cut at? We talked. We just said PR, and I'm saying it's all cyclical because you got. A PR issue. Well, let's say PR is getting money taken out of it right now for Bennett, right? Right. But Bennett needs more students. 
Exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. So, so, so why so, would you go there? I'm up for that, yeah. <laughs> if anything, you, you say we need we need about a hundred grand more for PR. Yeah. Right. 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 You, you need to put more money in. Right. And, you know, it, it. Like I said, it's it's a lot. It, it's so much that you could just really touch on. It's eventually though, like Bennett, and this is like a, this is ringing the bell for a lot of other schools, but essentially. You can't, you can't, you can't fix your issues by put. You can't fix uh, uh, internal bleeding by continuing to put band aid on something. No, no. And that, that's can't put a band aid on a bullet shot wound. We, nah. but we have to get to the point of realizing, or, or at least our administrators understanding what is a what is a band aid versus what is a suture versus what is surgery. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. we've not done it that way we've always been able to escape again this is the second time the second round of Bennett facing probation accreditation warning this is just the first time that they said you're you're not going to make it and so if you've been able to skate by two three times just google just google it how many times have schools gone no, on, you're right. on, on warning and probation and they've gotten out of it and that's that's why right. Jabal and I debate in a brother way of course if, if, if they, they could have done this a long time ago if they wanted to knock somebody off the map it would have been all too easy to do this is well, it's I getting leadership it's, was different what? i think leadership was different i agree with that um um and so to go back to your earlier question about you know there being some different standards i do think there's a certain standard and uh different standard and different undertone taken when it comes to our hbcu even in in the uh interview Belle Wheeling, SACS COC president, did last week. She said, I'm afraid we're going to see more and more small private institutions either close or get dropped from membership. Mm-hmm. But I would hope they would merge so that their legacy is not lost. But that's a valid, um, that's a valid point. However, <laughs> speaking to that point, um, when we talk about our small private institutions, specifically, we t- we're taking a look at Bennett today. Mm-hmm. Bennett has an option. Will they take the option? Is is the question. And my thing is, if we talk about enrollment management, my goal for Bennett would be a move similar to Benedict College. You cut tuition by five thousand dollars, and you increase your enrollment. We we'll take it and ex- examine what is the cost. What does it really cost to educate a Bennett Bell? Is it twenty nine? Or can you survive off of getting a student off of twenty three thousand mm-hmm. um, and in growing your in growing your enrollment? Now I say this to say enrollment again cannot be the only thing that stabilizes your budget. What are your stocks? What are your bonds? What does your endowment look oh, like? Right. You know you have a surplus every year. Um, this year you had a surplus of four hundred sixty one thousand dollars. You're aiming for another three hundred thousand dollars surplus at the end of this fiscal year. Um, what right size have you done in academic offerings? If you have a program that just has three or four students majoring in it, why do we need it? We need to have have a bottom line conversation. Is this program really helping us get where we're trying to go? But that also, um, but that also goes to your point because if they cut too many programs, then you're not in compliance right. with 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 SACS either. But when you say cut programs, you also can look at what programs are beneficial to your community. Mm-hmm. What 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 programs are beneficial um, right. that your alums have taken up and have gone and flourished in? Um, and I think you have to tell that story. With SAC CLC, I'm I'm a I'm a firm believer that judgments are already made for small HBCUs before you even get there. Yep. Um, and I say that to say, um, even with my own school, when when SAC decided to take us. Um, out of membership the night before we even pleaded our case the president and another member of the committee were having dinner in a restaurant and did not know that the Payne College Board of Trustee member was sitting at a table directly behind them and they had a conversation said yeah we're already decided to take them out of membership you know you those conversations before you even hear the person's plea <laughs> and you're having that conversation in open form I think that it it, it it goes against the number one principle of SAC CLC, and that's integrity. Um, and so, again, I'm going to continue to state the fact that we have to have some some checks and balances with SAC CLC and how they judge institutions. Because I'm still at the same point of 
uh, yes, the Episcopal Church bailed out saying, oh, but I'm never mind. I'm not even going to go there. Um, but <laughs> but let, was, me, let me say this. They do, they do allow for some, some, and I will concede the point, some checks and balances because they, they allow on those site review committees and those overview committees sitting in former presidents from HBCUs who can effectively make the case and say, yeah, they didn't meet their enrollment goal, but these are the challenges they had. And they, they contextualize why it's different for HBCUs versus any other kind of school that may be in the membership at large or even in the region. So they do have fail safes there. If they can do, if they can make the story work, they make the story work. And I think that happened for St. Augs, that people were on that committee that were able to say the church is going to do X, Y and Z. But let's finish out with this. And I'm going I'm to finish out with Sean with the with the elephant in the room. And I mean, no offense by this. And I'm asking you unfairly, admittedly, to speak for all Bennett Bells on this question. If somebody came to you from administration and said, you know what? It's too much. It's too hard. We ought to think about merging with A and T. What would be the reaction of 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 Bennett Bells? I think the reaction from Bennett Bells would be, if you're not up for the challenge, get out the way so somebody else can step up. Mm -hmm. That's what I honestly think. I think that North Carolina A and T. Let me let me be really clear. I took at some points uh, in my time at Bennett, I took more classes at A and T than I did at Bennett because. We were allowed to. Mm. You know, you have a consortium, and it, w it worked for my schedule. So I'm receiving awards for academics and all kinds of stuff, and I'm not even an Aggie, you know, <laughs> but you've got me on the road. <laughs> 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 People thought I was A&T, you mm -hmm. know. But it was a wonderful opportunity. Sell that. Some people don't even know that we have dual enrollment programs with A&T. And so if you're wanting your daughter to come and get that, uh, I don't believe in magic, so I call it black girl brilliance. If you're wanting to get that black girl brilliance experience, then Bennett is the place for that. Now, how we reconcile that with the money is a whole different animal. But to say just wholesale, like Bell Whelan said, that merge, merge our identity, merge who we are, why we were founded in the first place, I don't think so. Now, if, if we had been like some other schools lingering around for several years without accreditation and, and just no hope of, of getting this thing together, th then maybe we ought to take a different route. But I think it's too early to throw in the towel for Bennett College. I think that there are some other things that we can do. I think that there are some programs and some monies that can be put together. But what it's going to require is strategic thinkers who are not Bennett Bell to come to the table and say, you know what, for the culture, we're going to do it. For, for my black daughters who may want to attend, I want to do this. For my black grandmother who came here when she couldn't go anywhere else, I'm going to do this. And so this is on everybody else and not just us to say, let's get it done. This has been a fascinating conversation and one we're going to keep having uh, because in the next weeks and months, of course, uh, Bennett will keep fighting and there will continue to be stories to be told about this. So, uh, Sean says we appreciate you coming on Frat 06 as usual. Uh, Jay Moss, thank you again uh, for the argument on accreditation. I learned more today than I knew yesterday. Uh, Captain Crunch, thank you as producer. Uh, Scott Jerisha, thank you as well. Tiff, are we, are we going to do this again? That's Question. Okay. Answer. Can I give a quick shout out real quick? No. <laughs> I mean, but it's, 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 I'm just saying. No, they, go ahead. They, um, so to Rachel Pridgen, Ashley Jones, Aisha Lassiter, and Kim Dry Dancy, they all work at Bennett within campus life and student life. Mm -hmm. And when I tell you, those women are actually doing the work. Oh, and Santiba Campbell, she's around. They are actually doing work at Bennett. Now, I'm pretty sure other people are, but I know for a fact just from working with those women with my short extent there, they love Bennett just as much as I do. And they want to see Bennett stay and do the work as well. And that's just a microcosm of people on and off campus who feel that way. Um, and that's just right. that's just HBCUs at large. People attach their lives and their spirits to these schools. And so we can't let it go out like this uh, and we can't get let it go out without any strategy. But family, thank you all so much. Um, thank you again for tuning in to Digest After Dark. Thank you again uh, for your support on uh, HBCU Radio on Sirius 142, Sirius XM. Until next time, peace.